it's wonderful of you all to spend this lovely sunny day with us at Irving House. I hope we don't get that many sunny days. And just for those of you who have been to Irving House, just a couple of quick facts. It's the oldest intact house in the Lower Mainland. It was built in 1865 for Captain Irving and our first remarkable woman, Elizabeth Irving. Well, Elizabeth Dixon Irving. She was Elizabeth Dixon when they first met. And we're standing here in the small parlor. And that's a, a place where the Irvings and later the Briggs would entertain people that they weren't quite so friendly with. This isn't really a, a family room as the large parlor came to be. And it's full of wonderful treasures. I, I know that you can't see everything, but you know, we get bar open on Saturdays if you want to come and see it. Um, I know I'm surrounded by photographs and I probably wave my arms as I am what to do and you won't be able to see them, but we've got a little slideshow for you at the end so you can see some of the actual pictures. On to the story of Elizabeth Jane Dixon. I just automatically point to your picture. It's over there on the wall. Now, she, um, our story, we're going to start at Portland. Uh, but I would like to tell you how she got there. She came over the Oregon Trail with her family. That was a journey of seven months. Imagine that, being on the trail for seven months. And it was particularly hard for the women on the trail because many of them were pregnant, many of them gave birth. Um, the idea is to get over that trail and into Portland before the snow comes. And so the wagon master had to hurry them on no matter, you know, if they had their washing to do, just giving birth, on they go. She arrives in Oakland Trail, and she comes into Portland, which is a huge city now, but it wasn't much there back then. But this is a big thing. It's uh, people are being encouraged to come to Oregon, and one little carrot that the government is dangling in front of them is the offer of free land. I mean, that's that's huge. Um, the interesting thing about this offer is Elizabeth Jane Dixon. Once she was married to Captain Earth, she got 320 acres in her own name, in perpetuity, to do what she wanted with. And he got 320 acres. I would just like to briefly acknowledge that this land was brutally, brutally taken from the Native Americans. I, I, I've done a lot of research on various things. I, I'm Irish. I've had to do a lot of research in the famine, which is hard. But reading about what happened in Oregon is sometimes hard to take. Just want you to be aware of that. And so she meets Captain Irving. Where's he from? Well, he's from Scotland. He's a sailor, a very good sailor, because he gets to put on the hard, hard way, I should say, coming down through the treacherous seas of the Cape and up the coast to California. 1849, California gold rush. He offloads his supplies. I expect he got a very good dollar for them. And he offloads his passengers, gold seekers. He doesn't stay there. He's only there for two months. Hears about the opportunities in Oregon. Up he comes. Uh, he's a captain. Uh, he needs wood, and Elizabeth Dixon's father, James, is in the lumber industry. And, and, and he actually buys property, $1,000, as well as this case that he's given by the government. If you want a date, they married in September 1851. She has just turned 18. Our good captain, he's up there before we have to obviously be over there. He is 38. The big, the actually there's, there, there's 18 years difference. Math is what's going on. There's 18 years difference between them. That's not that uncomfortable in that year. In Oregon, they will have four children. Um, just before the last uh, of those children is born, that's Lizzie. He makes his move up to British Columbia. Or what is not British, he is attracted 
he's attracted primarily by the gold. Now, our good captain, he's one of those people who knows gold rush, there's, there's a chance to make money there, but I'm not going to dig for gold. I'm going to sell services to the people. So they stay in Victoria. She comes up and she's had the baby. They're in Victoria, start building ships, having ships built, I should say. And then they make their move to Westminster in 1865. So there we are, 1865. They had one more child in Victoria called Nellie. So now there's a family of five children. So the first part of Elizabeth's life is wife and mom. And don't know that much about it. But in 1872, everything changes because that's when Captain William dies. He dies of pneumonia. He, he died in this house and everybody was so shocked. Um, Elizabeth has to reinvent herself as widows have to. She is now in charge. Her oldest son is only 17. His name's John. And he's going to take over the family business. The family business of getting people up and down the highway, up from Victoria, across from Victoria, up the Fraser River. The Fraser River is the highway that I'm speaking of. He's been training with his father, 16, but he's still very young. But he takes over the business, Elizabeth Health. I think this is her apprenticeship. This house, this beautiful house, has not been left completely to her. I should explain that Victorian wills were very different because of Married Women's Property Acts. She can only live in this house as long as she remains a widow. She's still very young. She's very attractive. But don't, don't need to feel too sorry for her because she's left an awful lot more property by the captain. I think you need a friend's accountant to track it all, but it's a huge amount of land in the city. And uh, we know that because uh, taxes were paid on her behalf. And she still has all that property in Portland. And that's coming up in price. So I'm going to fast forward to 1882. By now, all of the girls are married. And Elizabeth makes her move. She starts to sell her property in Portland. Now this is one sharp cookie. She knows exactly what she wants and she knows how to get it. Make no mistake about that. So 1882, she died in Portland. She's a huge land assembly of 288 acres, which she sells. If you are reading about this land sale, there's lots of people in Portland have written books about Irvington. That's a huge area of Portland. It named after, guess who, Art Irving. You will find that there are strict covenants on this property. They are anti-Oriental. And I don't know where this comes from because it's the first example of it in Portland, but Elizabeth wants this land to sell much higher than a joint box, it's going to be exclusive, exclusive. Later on, after she sells this property, big marketing uh, fact is, you know, this is, this is a great place to live. Your neighbor isn't anybody you wouldn't want to know. Hmm. I think we can all read what that's supposed to mean. So she continues marketing her property. She's backwards and forwards. I mean, there are both. Run, this business is run by her son. She's not paying for her fare. And in around that time, her daughter, second part of the war, Mary, Mary Briggs, leaves uh, Victoria with her husband. I, I keep forgetting what to talk about him. His name's Thomas Lasher, but he's important to the story because they, they go on to have nine children. Mary acquires this house. Elizabeth is going to leave. Mary and Thomas are living here. Mother Elizabeth still owns the house. It, you know, he's a god that they would track them all down. And in 1884, a rather strange thing happens. This house is sold at auction in Victoria. And strangely enough, 
it goes to Mary Briggs, family will always find a way. They'll always find a workaround and a way to make things happen. And the price is $2,000. Hmm, how did she got that from? That's what Daddy left her in the will. What's meanwhile? Well, I know we're sort of morphing into Mary, but we still have some ways to go with Elizabeth. She decides that she will marry again. She marries a man called Anthony George Ryan. Um, he's born in England, but his parents are Irish. There is uh, a belief that he worked for Captain America's property. He's listed in census documents as a farmer, sometimes as a gardener, and horse breeder. That's one big thing these two have in common. They love horses, they love breeding horses. They marry in New York in 1887. Uh, they go off to Europe, they buy livestock, their farm that they're going to run together. Life is wonderful. I think we need to Back they come. And don't worry, I'll show you the picture of that gorgeous house later on. Build the house. Life is good. Family weren't very keen on this second marriage. He is much younger than she is. He's about 16 years younger. So, you know, she's just average again. Then, 1893, things start to go badly wrong. He's Comes an alcoholic, that's Anthony, and she divorces him. Yeah, she divorces him. And that took some courage because in those days, there's no such thing as privacy, everything's written up in the papers. That's good because that's how we know so much about how much preparation. They own a business together, it's a ranch, it's where all the horse breeding goes on, and she wants that back. The judge rules in her favor in the divorce. It's granted in January 1896. She retains all her property. She's been able to prove that she bought it with her own money, but there's this ranch. And there's a mortgage on this ranch. And they bought it together. So he has it. She wants it back and she gets it back. This woman, when she started selling property, she put mortgages. She held the mortgage on the property, I should say. So if you default, she's going to take it back. She does. And she. So what she does is she goes to the judge and she says, you know, I'm paraphrasing. My ex husband, Anthony, he's drinking himself to death. I think he should be appointed a public guardian. But he is. And eventually, she. Gets that back. And, and she has a huge property in um, Portland where she runs a racetrack. It's not quite a thing for a lady to do, and also she's sort of run at arm's length, but don't make any mistakes. She is the one in charge. So that's a little brief story of uh, Elizabeth Jane. After she divorces Anthony, she moves in with her daughter Lizzie. That's her fourth child. And that house is still there in Portland. Very beautiful house. I've been in it. And uh, if you ever want to go around and walk into a Irvington, I'm sure there are sources you can look up. I was lucky enough. I have a friend who lives there. Uh, he took me on the tour. Now we're going to leave this beautiful small parlor that was um, decorated by Mary and we're going to go into the large parlor. So if you'd like to follow me, I hope you're all still with me. And my little feet is on, that's what the noise is, because I don't want to stand on the original carpet in my street shoes. Isn't this gorgeous? Mary, this is now we're talking about Mary. Mary and her husband have three children in Victoria, uh, when she comes here, she's pregnant with Beryl. Beryl is born in U.S. history. That's her first daughter. And Mary's the first part of her life is taken up with child rearing. She has a child once every two years, which is pretty typical for the times. It's just bang on if you're looking at statistics. She does like to decorate. 
I'm telling you, this woman was elected, they should have a whole TV show. I'm standing in this room, she transformed from a sort of very plain Victorian house into this gorgeous Edwardian, almost mansion is the word for thing to use. Beautiful French wallpaper on the walls in a small part, she decorated that in 1887 too. That's for absolutely gorgeous paper. And it's recently been cleaned. When I say recently, it's probably about three years since it's been cleaned, so it just sparkles. In this room, there's no original furniture, but the mirror is original. And I know we can't see it, but around the corners of the room, cornices is a beautiful frieze made to look like gold. So that's a nod to Captain Irving's maritime heritage. So what's remarkable about Mary? Yes, many were married and had nine children. Well, first of all, she seems to have been a very good mother. All her children seem to have got on very well with her uh, and enjoyed a very close relationship with her. And then as they grow up, she has more time. And, and Mary is a, a, a woman of a class that can afford to have servants in the house. She had uh, Chinese domestic servants. She had Chinese domestic cook and gardener. Don't know their names because they're never recorded in the census, sadly. And she also has a woman to look after the children. Her name is Madalena Smith, and she's going to be uh, in our next Remarkable Women show. She's, uh, I call her RW2. So back to Mary. As she gets more time, she begins, like many women of her class, to expand her role as mother to the wider world. Um, we call them in Canada maternal feminists. And this was as I've been at university where we used to use the phrase rocking the cradle of the world. And she just ticks every box. She is a member of the Victorian Order of Nurses. Uh, she's a member of the YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association. I always get that one wrong. I've got it right now. And, and so many that I, I couldn't. I'd be here for Christmas if I was going to list them all. And she's a tireless fundraiser for our Royal Columbian Hospital right here in Westminster. And she really signed on. She goes to these meetings. She says, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll have a party at my house. It's a big house. And we'll have games. And we'll, we'll sell this. We'll have to sell that. We'll sell tickets for this, tickets for that. She supports the local orphanage by having what we call it jam and butter tea and always 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 thinking about the wider implications i just looked up the local council of minutes local council of women minutes for new westminster and, and i was astounded at the level of involvement and the police matron okay you go down to the, the jail and you be the police matron that's huge because before that Women who were brought in and arrested didn't have, had to be searched by male guards, didn't have any privacy. They just, they go to the they'll step up. They're gonna collect, they're gonna put boxes at the farmer's market and collect food. And you often find with these women, there's a personal connection to the organizations that they favor. And I certainly see that with Victorian Order of Nurses. They're, they're district nurses, they're not hospital. But Mary had a um, tragedy in her life. Her daughter, Beryl, who was born just after she had moved to Westminster, died of preeclampsia uh, in childbirth, which is, was a terrible death in those days. And uh, the baby died too. And uh, so she has not much tragedy in her life. There are other things, but uh, we'll just well on that for now. And so we have Elizabeth and we have Mary. And they are women who, as they move the stages of their life, their lives change. Um, Thomas died in 1921. And 1920s, 1920, Mary, uh, the 
goes on until 1931. But all the way through her life, her home is a refuge. Family people will come and stay here. Her son comes and stays here when he's articling. That's her son, William. Surprisingly enough, she called her first son, William. And her granddaughter is studying at the college here in New Westminster. She comes and stays. And it's a very good thing this granddaughter did come because she's left some lovely records of what life was like here at the right to have afternoon tea in the library in the winter time and in the summer on the veranda. I don't know if you can pick it up. That's the roar of the traffic out there. Uh, but of course, in those days, they didn't have to deal with that. There was traffic all right, but nothing like what we experienced when we were at today. So when you come here, have a look around, look at this, because I'm just assuming that you're all going to come. Uh, look at the beautiful wallpaper on the walls, the doors, and in the hallway, there's even more gorgeous things because that has just, I say just been, the pandemic was thrown off my time, it must have been a couple of years ago. The hallway has been re-wallpaper, just invented that word uh, in uh, a very, very close copy of the original wallpaper Mary put on the walls in 1903. No, I didn't mean to suggest our Mary is up a ladder to because she will have people doing it for her. And yes, I did tell you these two rooms were decorated. We decorated in 1887 and extra rooms put in upstairs and all sorts of changes made. She liked to decorate, so in 1903, she did it all over. Again, except she left these two rooms. These are 1887, and the rest of the house is 1903. So when you read the room, look at my watch, see how we're doing the time. Because we have got another remarkable woman to tell you about. Deep breath. She is has been the most challenging one to find. And the easiest one to find, it's a, it's a contradiction in terms, but I wanted to find a real Mary Eileen. Mary Eileen, our third remarkable woman, is Elizabeth's granddaughter. Remember I said she had five children. Let me see if I can get them in order. And Mary, John, the one who runs the business, who was incidentally born at sea. We don't want her. And the next daughter, the third daughter, Third child, second daughter, Susan. And Susan married at Steamboat Men. That's what they call them, Steamboat Men. And um, they lived for quite some time in Vancouver. I see a picture of their house when we go downstairs. I hope you're with me. I know it's a long time to just leave it like that. So rigorous. I normally do these tours live when people ask me questions and I don't have to. Uh, and I go more into more personal detail, but I, I just want to understand that um, Susan had three children and the youngest, Mary Eileen, was born in Vancouver and visited this house often. And I think I'll talk a little bit more about her downstairs. Um, I think that's what we will do now. So you'll, you'll have to bear with me because the stairs in this house are very old, very steep, and they're very narrow. And they're, it's hard for me to get down the stairs. I mean, they did say the most dangerous thing in Victoria House was the stairs, especially long skirts for carrying things. So if you'll just bear with me, we're going to go downstairs. I am not a technological person. I assume they're going to be passed over to Michelle. Would that be right, Alan? Uh, um, Thumbs up from Alan, but you can see. Alan is our cameraman, and he has been the most fantastic help. So I'm very, very bad at remembering to thank people. So I'm going to thank, use this opportunity while it's in my little brain to thank Alan Blair, who's the registrar of the Westminster Museums and Archives, and a huge thank you to Michelle Taylor, who is. Um, in charge of programming, 
got a new title quite recently. So she, she can tell you what she, she knows what she is, but she's been fabulous and she's been such a support to me uh, and on this program. It's just, it's so much easier when you have such wonderful people to work with. All right, I'm going downstairs. Bear with me.